If you have your Bibles, please open to Proverbs chapter 6. Now, when you came in, you were also given a bulletin. And in the bulletin, there's a a little insert, and it's kind of an old-fashioned thing. I used to do this a long time ago. It's a fill-in-the-blank, and it gets you to, uh, you know, participate a little bit, to interact, and you uh, are kind of with me in the message a little more. So I'm doing it just for this sermon. It's a one-time thing. And if you don't like it, it makes a great airplane. You can fold it right, and shoom. And so... uh, Uh, Hopefully, I'll remember to tell you what all those words are that you're to fill in. So we're in Proverbs 6, and uh, we started a couple weeks ago. We introduced the whole book on a Sunday morning as kind of the theme of the year, uh, wisdom and understanding as our theme. And then Pat Murphy, last Sunday night, took you through the balance of chapter 1. And in this chapter, we're in this section, chapters 1 to 9, Each chapter is a discourse or lecture on wisdom, the whole chapter. It stands by itself. And after you move past chapter 9, verse 22, you get into the individual proverbial sayings. And they're kind of like uh, beads on a, you know, pearls, (laughs) a bead of pearls. Like each one is a little special saying. And so tonight we have a whole section, verses uh, 1 to 19, and it's really dealing with the, the idea of a trap. So uh, I'm calling it staying out of trouble, but it's really staying out of traps. So trouble traps. And we all know what a trap is. Uh, we're not in a fishing uh, trapper kind of culture, but I'm sure you've seen a mouse trap and uh, you've probably actually seen a rabbit or some other animal in a trap. You've seen it on TV. And uh, in the spiritual realm, Uh, We don't see this in the book of Proverbs. You don't see the devil ever mentioned in the book of Proverbs. But in the spiritual realm, uh, he is the ultimate hunter of souls. And so when you think of Ephesians chapter 6, that part about the spiritual warfare and the armor actually opens with that thought that we're to put on the whole armor of God so that we might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And these are his traps. And so when we come into the book of Proverbs, the traps we're going to see there, and you see this quite often actually throughout the entire book, but this chapter in particular has like three. And uh, here we're dealing with very, it's, it's not quote unquote in the, in the invisible realm, it's just practical things in life, how we can get trapped in life. And all of us at some point in the past got trapped in sin and we had to be set free. We became captive to sin. And, uh, you know, when you think about a trap, some of the things that came to my mind as I was thinking about this today, uh, you're listening to the radio and all of a sudden, you know, CGAD or some other station says, oh, there's a speed trap, you know, on Highway 20. Boy, do I ever perk up when I hear that and I kind of slow the car down. I don't want to be caught in that trap. Or perhaps at some point in the past, you got caught in a credit card trap. You know, you had the credit card, and you were using that credit card, and all of a sudden, you couldn't pay the whole thing anymore. You're only paying the minimum, you know, the, the minimum payment. You're trapped. You got a problem. Your, your finances are out of control. I remember when I was in high school, uh, the beginning of gangs was happening. So it was a long time ago <laughs> that was in high school. But now it's a big thing, and teenagers get... Um, education on that, they hear about that, they're warned about not joining gangs. There's all kinds of gangs, and they have uh, special names. You actually find that in Proverbs chapter 1. If you read it carefully, you see that what Solomon seems to be talking about there is the beginning of gangs. You know, if someone says to you, hey, let's, uh, let's form a group here, and we'll go and, you know, capture some poor soul and take everything he has, it's really talking about a gang, a violent gang. So as we look at this, uh, tonight we're going to see uh, three kinds of persons and three kinds of traps. In verses 1 to 5, uh, I've given it a title. I didn't know what to call it. I call it the impulsive do-gooder. If you come up with a better title, please tell me. Uh, verses 6 to 11, very simple, the lazy person. And finally, verses 12 to 19, the troublemaker. 
the troublemaker is a person who actually sets traps for other people to catch them. And we know that Paul's using the idea, the picture of a trap to hold all 19 verses together. Uh, you see in verses two and three, he actually uses the word trap. You've been trapped, free yourself. You've fallen into something. Uh, in verse 11, uh, poverty surprises you like a trap. It's something very swift. All of a sudden, whoops, you're, you're caught in it. And finally, uh, verse 15, disaster strikes swiftly like a snare. So you got this big mental picture of a trap, and we're going to work it through. And so our, our first trap, trap number one, is uh, this is how I would define it. It's putting up, and if you're writing now, putting up, you just write in security. Security to cover your neighbor's debt is giving yourself into your neighbor's right control. Isn't this fun? Okay, and if you're liking it, you can say, I'm having so much fun. Well, here's the verse, verse one. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, if you have shaken hands in pledge for a stranger, come and I'll just stop there. Now, the word security here is a very interesting word. It's actually the same word used to describe the Holy Spirit. Uh, the word in Greek is erebon, and it means security. The Holy Spirit is the security inwardly for our salvation. And that cost a lot. You know, Jesus didn't get uh, himself into a trap to get us out of trouble. He volunteered himself and made himself a ransom. And the, it was very, very costly. When we get caught in this kind of a trap, it costs us as well. Uh, there's an illustration of this. Uh, Judah made himself a security for his supposed brother's sin, Benjamin. Remember the story in Genesis 43. He actually tells his father, you know, my soul for his. Uh, I will give myself as a security so he can be released. And that was a big point in Judah's favor. And you might wonder, well, what is this actually talking about today? And the closest thing I could think of was somebody asking you to co-sign for, for them. Have you ever been asked for that? Someone said, hey, you mind co-signing for my loan? It's not a big deal. It's only $20,000 and, you know, I just need your signature. It's not a biggie. And uh, I, can, I can cover this. I got it. And sure, you know, and you just put your signature on there. You don't even read the contract and, you know, you do it. Or maybe someone's asked you for a big sum of money. Uh, actually, Valerie and I, somebody asked us, we don't even know the person very well, but asked us for a large sum of money because they were in trouble. And you have to think about that. You're, it's right on the spot. Um, so what happens in the co-signing situation is uh, the lender will come to you because your signature is on that contract. And so if they don't make the payment, guess who's making the payment? You. Now, I'm pretty sure in Solomon's day, he wasn't talking about the Bank of Montreal or TD. He was talking about something else. I don't know exactly what it was, but it's probably not an institution, but more a person. And so maybe the person's a much bigger person, <laughs> and he comes to you and says, you know, in a threatening way, pay up because the guy you made a pledge for isn't paying, you're paying. And it, it's something like that. We don't know exactly the, the precise thing, but I don't think it was a financial institution. So uh, the thing about this is that it happens very quickly. So you're writing now, this kind of trap is triggered very quickly by what? By your impulsiveness. And I know in over 34 years of marriage with Valerie, it's come to light to my attention that impulsiveness is something I've had to work on. I can be impulsive. You know, I can do, I do things quickly. And uh, you see it in verse two. The person's trapped by their own words. You have been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth. And so here's a person who's trapped because they spoke too quickly, made a quick promise, said yes, um, and now that person's trouble is your trouble. That person's financial situation, well, it's a part of your life now. And you might ask, well, what's the deeper motivation for doing this? And I think it really probably is two things, pride or fear. And the pride is, ah, sure, you know, what are friends for? I, could, I got that. I can, I can help you out. And you come across as the hero. 
or it's fear. What is that person going to think of me if I say no? I'm going to look like a very negative um, thing in that person's eyes, a cheapskate, whatever you want to call it. And, And so fear or pride could be the motivation. But again, the Proverbs warn over and over, when you go past chapter 9, you get into the individual proverbial sayings, and now listen to two, I'll quote, uh, Proverbs 11.15 says, whoever puts up security for a stranger will surely suffer, but whoever refuses to shake hands in a pledge is safe. Proverbs 22, verse 26 Do not be one who shakes hands in pledge or puts up security for debts. If you lack the means to pay, your very bed will be snatched from under you. So it's just a very quaint way of saying, you're going to pay the price for doing this. It's a trap. Now, the person who's asking for the help may not even be setting up the trap. They're just asking for help. They got themselves into trouble. But remember I mentioned earlier the hunter of our souls sets traps. He could be using this to mess up your life in a big, big way. Um, You know, this person got themselves in trouble, and are you really helping them by getting them out of trouble by taking their trouble into your life? And when when you stop and think about it, maybe you're, you're getting in the way of depriving them from a lesson in life. They need to learn this. And it, it's just the way life is. Sometimes our parents do this. They see us at a certain age, get ourselves into trouble, and they just say, you know what? I'm not bailing you out. <laughs> You're going to have to learn your lesson about this one. And sometimes parents have let their teenage son maybe stay in jail overnight for one night. Said, I'm not going to pay the bail. You're going to stay here tonight, and you, know, you can think about this. I'm just giving an example. Uh, one of my favorite financial persons is David Ramsey. Maybe you've heard him on the radio, Christian fellow on 760, and uh, people often say, oh, how are you doing? And he says, better than I deserve. That's David Ramsey. He always says that, better than I deserve. That's his grace uh, expression. And he would say, uh, you know, it's not a good idea to to bail people out uh, and to take on their debts. You have to be very, very careful. Now, he's not talking about family, and, and Solomon here is talking about your neighbor or a stranger. To me, I mean, the further away the person is, the more foolish you are to even consider it. When it's a family member, you got to really pray on that one. That's something you pray about. Um, so that's a tough one. Uh, when it's family, I, I think my father probably co-signed for me when I was young <laughs> for a car or something. I can't remember. So I think that's a different thing. And we're not talking about giving gifts. You know, if you want to give a gift and say, you know what, I'm going to pay for your thing, it's a gift. Uh, I'm not co-signing nothing. That's a different matter. And I'm going to stop here and and let the floor be open for anyone who might have a question or maybe a comment. Any question or comment about this? Otherwise, I'm going to keep plowing on. Rosemary? Rosemary? That's, it's, a, it's related to the discussion for sure. So giving is a different thing. And there's times where, okay, if it's a large sum of money and it's somebody you really love a lot and you say, you know what? I'm giving this, I'm gonna, it's a gift. And you don't get into this struggle of the soul while you got to. And then there's another verse too about giving or making loans without interest. And this is right in the covenant. You know, the Jews were not to a charge usury. So again, uh, there will probably be a sermon about money matters, so I don't want to get into that too much. I've asked Marco Terry to take that on, so that'll be down the road. But that's a good point. Any other last question? Otherwise, I'll go into the next one. Oh, two, okay. Mary first. There you go. Yeah. And behind that. Yep. 
And maybe it's just a plain gift. I said, here's, here's $500, I'm giving it to you as a gift. I'm bailing you out and, that, and it's over. And I think the other thing too is there's a third party involved here. So the person's become indebted to somebody else and they want you to come in and make a pledge or to be a security for their debt. So it's, it's, it's a little, so if you wanna bail them out and just pay for it and that's it and you got the money, there's one more, oh boy, oh boy, I really got myself in trouble here. Okay, hope first, I think. It's hope, yeah. Yep. And I think too is you might be pledging something you actually can't pay. Like maybe it's a very large sum of money and you actually cannot pay it and now you're stuck with it. And this could really mess up your life. Over here, I don't know, some uh, two, okay, and then Loretta after. And paying attention to the language uh, of, of uh, Solomon, it's, it's a little different. So your own family versus a neighbor. And Loretta, you'll be the last one and then we'll go to the next one. Okay, moving along. <laughs> okay, and now, well, how do we get out of this trouble? Um, Solomon says in verse three, and I think what he's saying here is pride got you into this. It's gonna be humility that gets you out. So verse three, so do this, my son, to free yourself. Since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands, go to the point of exhaustion. This is a paraphrase and give your neighbor no rest. So two things, go humble yourself and go right away. I mean, do this. Pride could have got you into this. Humility will be the only way out. And uh, he even goes on in verse four and says, allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle. So you're getting that trap picture. Free yourself like a gazelle uh, from the hand of the hunter like a bird from the snare of the fowler. So, um, I would say you go to that person and say, look, I made a really big mistake. I don't want to do this anymore. If it's not a legal thing where it's the BMO and you've got a contract, you're you're in. (laughs) But if this is just something between the two of you, uh, Solomon is saying, go to that person and say, look, I, I made a mistake. This is wrong. I shouldn't do this. Will you please let me out of my, uh, my promise. Boy, that's, that's humbling yourself. That's saying I did a very foolish thing and now I wanna do a wise thing. Let's keep going. I'm gonna go to tr- trouble trap number two. And this one is the sluggard. And starting off right away, I'll say we probably all have a little bit of, the, of this in us. And um, another word for this is laziness. And this person is told, verse six, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. Well, we know more probably about ants than we do about sluggards. And uh, we know ants you know, work hard. And maybe you've seen on the National Geographic, you know, the ant colonies and how they can carry things that are you know, triple or 10 times their own weight. They're very strong and they work together, they work hard, and they have a way of, of working as a team. Now when it comes to sluggards, the only thing I know about slugs is uh, they're slimy and slow and are great in escargot. That's all I know about slugs. And so transfer slug over to slugger the person and um, 
I guess the, the key thing is, is slow and you know, the appearance of laziness. A sluggard or a slug doesn't look like a hardworking little critter, does it? Just kind of in its shell, creeping along, very slow, very slimy, not doing much. So now in the fill-in, it says here, giving in to laziness is a slow but sure way to poverty. So giving in to laziness. My idea here is that we all have some of it in us. We all have a bit of laziness. And the impulsive person gets into trouble financially quickly. This person gets into financial trouble slowly. It's, it's what they say to themselves. Now the sluggard, it's a very interesting word in Proverbs. Sluggard or sloth. So you know what a sloth is. You know that guy that hangs upside down from the tree, got a little smile on his face, and he doesn't move very fast either. And uh, 17 times you'll find the sluggard contrasted with the diligent, hardworking person. So this contrast is set up. And uh, it's a condition of the soul. So you think of in the physical, uh, you know, a physical slowness. Uh, I think this is like emotional, spiritual slowness. Um, They just don't like to work hard. And we're going to keep verse 7 and 8 for a minute, but go down to verses 9 to 11 and see what the sluggard says to himself. And you know what? I've probably said this to myself and actually quoted the verse while I was doing it. No joke. (laughs) Here's me talking to me. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and on and on it goes. And certainly we wanna make some qualifications here. I had a nap this afternoon, because I got up really early. I always have my, I used to call it my Baptist power nap. Now I call it my AGC power nap. And I just, you know, at some point when the energy is going down like this, I just, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, recharge the batteries and I am good to go. I nap to work. This guy isn't napping to work. He's just napping to nap to nap. It's like, it's, it's a problem. And so in the fill-in now, uh, this kind of trap is set, here it is, by too much of a good thing. Sleep is a good thing. It's a gift from God. But it can become a bad thing. And by our own, and you're right, rationalizing. So we all need uh, the R&R and Strangely, I was talking to Marty about this. It must have been in my subconscious before the service. And I was talking, so Marty, how much sleep do you get? And uh, we were comparing notes and agreeing that seven to eight hours is probably all we need with maybe a little power nap somewhere in the day if we need it. And um, so we go now to verses seven and eight, and here's where the lesson comes. And when you read this, Get the picture, and I'll try and picture the ant in your mind. Verse seven, the ant, it has no commander, no overseer, or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. So a couple more fill-ins now. So here are the lessons. Learn, and right now, initiative and responsibility. When I think of that, I think of Joseph in the Old Testament. Remember when we did Joseph, how hardworking he was, how he stored up, and even before the storing up years, when he was uh, in Potiphar's house, when he was uh, the overseer of the prison, and then he rose to that high place, and he stored up for seven years. Now, this guy was not, (laughs) he wasn't lazy. He was a hardworking person. He took initiative. I don't think uh, Joseph was the kind of person who needed a boss looking over him. Uh, He bossed himself. He was his own boss. The second write-in or fill-in is learn to work ahead. Always working ahead, always thinking of, uh, you know, what I need for down the road without becoming a hoarder. You know, that's the other balance. So, you know, when we think of this, Uh, There's all kinds of traps that we could fall into uh, that are provided for by the state. And I gotta be really careful what I'm saying here. There's times in our life where we could be out of work, we're looking for work, and we need help, and that provision's there. But if a person sort of stays there forever and ever and ever and ceases to work, 
I think uh, that's getting out of, out of God's will. You know, the New Testament says, he who does not work does not eat. We're to be diligent, we're to work. And yet, uh, God's word also makes provision for those who can't. You know, the widow and the orphan, uh, even those uh, who couldn't afford uh, to feed themselves. You look in the book of Ruth. What did she do? She was gleaning in the fields, and that was the charity that was offered there. She had to work even to get her own food. Now, here comes the trap, verse 11. Here, here's how the sluggard uh, falls into the trap. It says, verse 11, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. We often uh, berate uh, those who accumulate wealth and the wealthy. We, we see a lot of that in scripture. But here is one of the rare times where we see the person who's lazy and brings themselves into poverty uh, being scolded and chided. And so the word here I think is squeeze the slug out of your soul. Like beat that slug out. And uh, yes, R&R, but um, be careful of it. And I, I look at myself and sometimes say, come on, Ken, let's get going here. Enough of this. You got stuff to do. Let's get going. So I talk to my own soul in that regard. I don't think too many people want to comment on this one or ask questions. <laughs> Does anybody want to ask me a question about this one? Rosemary. Yep. Eight or 12, and then that day is free. So I have kind of my own system, and maybe with someone else, there'll be a different system totally for the decision. Yeah, good balance. Accountability. Okay, let's go to the last trap. And um, this one, I had a hard time trying to illustrate. So maybe I'll ask for some comments at the end, and you can help me illustrate it. But this is the troublemaker. Uh, verse 12, a troublemaker and a villain who goes about, notice all the parts of his body that are involved. A troublemaker and a villain who goes about with a corrupt mouth, who winks maliciously with his eye, signals with his feet, and motions with his fingers, who plots evil with deceit in his heart, he always stirs up conflict. So in the villain here, it would be a person who, sets traps for others, falls into, or sorry, who sets traps for others to fall into is also setting a trap for themselves. Also setting a trap for themselves. And so the scoundrel, the villain here, the troublemaker gets in trouble with God first because they're trying to get other people into trouble. I think a cousin to this would be a gossip. And... Um, that comes to mind. The person that came to mind also was um, Judas Iscariot. And think of how he set a trap for Jesus. What part of his body did he use to set a trap for Jesus? How did he set him up? Was he, you know, he betrayed him with a kiss. It was kind of a signal. He used that as a signal for others to know he's the one, get him. And so you see the different body parts here. Verse 12, uh, he uses his mouth corruptly. That could be gossip, verse 13. He uses unholy sign language, eyes, feet, fingers. He has plots, he's a schemer, and uses the weaknesses of others. He brings others into his scheme, into his web. And what happens to this trap setter? Verse 15, therefore disaster will overtake him in an instant. He will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. And you see this over and over again in Proverbs. You know, the person's digging a ditch for others to fall into and falls into it himself. He sets a trap for others, he traps himself. And Judas Iscariot trapped himself. He ended up hanging himself by what he did, because of what he did. Now, verses 16 to 19 actually relate to the third trap. And we're gonna see uh, the troublemaker was using different parts of his body and this connects now with verses 16 to 19. And this is what uh, could be called a numerical saying. 
You see this in the book of Amos, and you also see it in Proverbs chapter 30, where you have a numerical saying. It's a, a grammatical device, a literary device to kind of grab your attention. It's, I find it really neat. My ear likes it. Whenever I read this, I say, oh, that sounds, I like the way that sounds in my ear. And so here it goes, verse 16. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Do you see is that kind of that parallel going on, six and seven? And I think in Amos it's three, four, three, four. And it just kind of, it, it grabs your attention. Now before we look at them, the fill-in is this. Uh, go to God and examine, you write, your soul with his word and learn, right, to hate what God hates. And now here are the six, seven things the Lord hates and detests. And so you can see this is all part of the troublemaker. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. And so, you know, I look at those uh, verses, and when I read the, the book of Proverbs, I find it's, uh, it's like a, a magnifying glass on my own soul. And every time I've been reading Proverbs all my life, just like you have, and I, Lord, examine me. See if there be any wicked way in me. And that's what we see. If, if God hates this, then I have to hate, if, if this is in me, hate it in me. But also, there's a warning. Maybe I'm in a, in a crowd, and I'm seeing somebody with shifty eyes, making signals, using his finger to do this and that with other people. I said, oh, I think I'm in a bad place here. <laughs> it's that basic that simple. And so I'm going to end here and close with, again, opening it to the floor. Does anybody have a question about this third character or a comment you want to make? Otherwise, I'm going to close in prayer. That was pretty basic, pretty simple. You don't want to be this person. That's, that's it. And you want to be aware of that kind of person. And so these are only some of the traps Actually, if you look in the book of Proverbs, there's many others, but these are three in Proverbs 6, um, verses 1 to 19. In the weeks to come, we're going to continue uh, for a little while. We're going to still be in the, the lecture section, chapters 1 to 9, and eventually we're going to get into individual themes, and so be praying for that. Uh, we're going to close in prayer, and we could pray about this, and then I'll ask you to stand for the benediction tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word that is so uh, basic in some areas of life. It warns us, and we think of young people and teenagers who just don't know yet, don't know the dangers in life, don't know the traps that are out there that could really mess up their lives. And Father, we know ourselves, the older we get, some of us, probably all of us, at some point got entrapped by something and got caught and paid the price and suffered and maybe even to this day live with consequences. And Lord, we thank you for that. Your word tells us that because you love us, you discipline every one of your children you chasten us, and often it's by our own actions. We learn that you are one way or the other when we obey you or we disobey you, and we get caught. Father, how we thank you that the Lord Jesus allowed himself to be ensnared and trapped in the Garden of Gethsemane, to be betrayed with a kiss, to be falsely accused, to be sentenced to death and to die so the captives could be set free. How we love him, how we love you, Father. Help us to walk in freedom. Help us to be among the wise. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.